My definition of a manifesto is a code for life. And within that code, there are a series of principles that we use on a regular basis. It is my personal belief that all of us have a manifesto, and within the manifesto, there are a series of principles that go along with your personal manifesto. The challenge is that oftentimes, this manifesto and these series of principles are hidden in a layer much into our subconscious or into our unconscious. So what we have to do on a regular basis is go through a process of reflection so that we can bring these principles from the unconscious, from the subconscious, into our awareness. Now, you might be thinking, why exactly is that important? Why do I need to do that? Well, what I'm hoping to do with the next few minutes is guide you through my personal manifesto as a scientist and as a researcher to show you how I've used this guiding principle of aspiring for novelty even in the face of, even in the face of routine to solve fairly complex problems in the laboratory. And this problem that I'm going to share with you occurred very early on in my academic career. So this is me as a young, budding PhD student, thinking I'm going to conquer the world, and I come to a stop. And using this manifesto, and in particular using one important principle of that manifesto, I was able to solve a really difficult problem that on surface seemed as if it didn't have a solution. So my PhD, looked at the central question of what factors influence time to sexual maturity in a developing female. And this is within the realm of behavioral neuroendocrinology. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but essentially what I was doing was looking at how hormonal factors influence the body as well as behavior. So one good place to start investigating this really exciting and dynamic question is within the context of the laboratory mouse. And this is where I started my work. Now, I use the picture of a laboratory mouse because in science, we owe a lot to the data that we've been able to collect from the laboratory mouse, and partly because the laboratory mouse shares a lot of physiological principles that occur in humans. So if I'm trying to look at what factors influence time of sexual maturity in a developing female, well, a great place to get started is within the context of a developing female mouse. Now, if there are a lot of similarities in the physiological system of a developing female human in comparison to a developing female mouse, then the first place to get started is to look at the changes that occur in their hormones. So, around the time of sexual maturity, there are two sex steroids that start to increase in the developing female, and they also start to increase, sorry, not only in a developing female mouse, but also in a developing female human. So how exactly does one go about measuring these hormones in a mouse model? Well, being housed in the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior, one of the things that I often thought about was the amount of stress that we might be giving to our experimental subjects. So I thought, is there some way to be able to capture the changes that occur in these hormones without actually drawing blood? without actually handling these animals aggressively and sticking needles into them. Now, luckily, there's a really easy way to do that. All you have to do is measure the output of these hormones in urine. The other thing that I started thinking about was the social environment of these animals. And the social environment of these animals is really important because when you have a developing female that is housed next to a novel, in other words, a new adult male that she's never encountered before, then her time to sexual maturity decreases. So in comparison to a female that might be living with her brother or brothers or her father, the female that is exposed to an adult male reaches sexual maturity sooner. So that's great. So here I am keeping in mind all these wonderful things. I know about the social environment of the animal. I'm going to measure these hormones that start to increase around the time of puberty in this female that is exposed to a variety of different conditions. And so I used a rather simple apparatus. 
So here is a cage in which you have a female here in、um, the white coat, and she is housed across a male that she has never encountered before. He's even of a different strain than her, and so. He is of a different coloration of fur, and so the expectation is: all I have to do is measure her urinary output of estradiol and progesterone, and voila, I should see some sort of a dramatic difference in comparison to females that are housed next to their fathers or next to their brothers. The way that we did that was: there is a wire grid mesh at the bottom of this cage. All the female really has to do is urinate through that, and we have this very Fancy scientific apparatus, also known as a baking sheet, and all you have to do is you collect urine, and there is no kind of stress that is that is involved. So here I am, and I think I have a really good, sound experimental paradigm to be able to capture these dramatic differences. And you might think that you know where this story is going, and it's really going there, which is. When I actually analyzed the urinary output of estradiol, what exactly did I see? Now I'm only going to talk about estradiol because the story for progesterone was really similar. This is what I like to call the zigzag dataset. What I was trying to capture was a marked difference between females that were exposed to these adult males, and I thought that there would this there would be an increase in the amount of estradiol that they were excreting in their urine. And instead, I got this. So all these different conditions are very difficult to tell apart. And you might say, "Well, no, Aisha. Eventually, you see an increase in estradiol over a period of time." And I say, "Yes, everyone reached puberty. Wonderful." But that's not exactly what I was trying to capture. So I went around and I said, "I'm still motivated, and I'm going to speak to my colleagues. I'm going to speak to my mentors." And what advice did I get? Well, they said, "This is the great thing about research. So you take that question and you think about it in new ways." And I thought, "Mm-hmm. How exactly do I do that? Well, you just research the problem over and over again until you come up with a solution." So here's where my manifesto kicked in. In terms of thinking about searching for novelty in the face of everyday routine, I walked back into the laboratory. And I really stood still, and I'm trying to reenact exactly what I did when I got my zigzaggy data pattern. And I looked around, and I looked at the cages, I looked at the animals, I looked at the water bottles, and I looked at their food. And I actually have to bend down a little bit if I really want to be truthful, because it was a really large bag of food. And I looked at the food, and I looked at the ingredients on that bag of food. And one of the things that I noticed. As I was trying to play around with this bag of food, apart from realizing that it was really heavy, was that soy was the primary protein ingredient. Now, soy is absolutely wonderful. It's used in lots and lots of laboratory diets. It's used across zoos in all parts of the world. There have been articles written about soy. So, for instance. Satchel in 2006 said the soy is this humble, humble entity. It is a vegetable protein of the highest quality. It has very little cholesterol. It is high on unsaturated fats. It's a good source of fiber. It has complex carbohydrates, and it's free of lactose, which is probably why it's used as a major source of protein. Okay, wonderful. So I started thinking a little bit further as I'm bending down. This is all happening within a matter of minutes. So I'm like, hmm, okay. The other thing that I know about soy is that it contains phytoestrogens, and they're called phytoestrogens because they come from a plant source, and they have chemicals which have the molecular structure that is fairly similar to estrogens that we naturally produce in the body. So you don't have to have an advanced background. In molecular chemistry, to recognize that this phytoestrogen, genestein, is very similar in molecular structure to this chemical structure of estradiol. So I started thinking a little bit further. I'm still bending down, by the way, because I'm thinking I've really got to come up with a solution by the time I get up. And so I thought, well, what if the urinary analysis that I was doing in the laboratory? 
was picking up not only estradiol in the urine, but also a phytoestrogen in urine, and basically washing out any results that I wanted to see. The other thing that I knew about, and here I'm taking information from a human model and extracting it to an animal model, is that very early on in development, so in utero, the developing fetus is exposed to the phytoestrogens that the mother is intaking. So I thought, if I need to produce some sort of a change, it has to occur very early in development, and it has to occur perhaps even prior to conception. And that's exactly what I did. So I phoned around. Well, eventually I got up. Then I went to my phone, and I phoned around, and I tried to find out if there were laboratory diets that contained protein were equally nutritionally valuable. Than the diet in comparison to the diet that we were using for our laboratory mouse in in our、uh, in our lab, and whether I could design an experiment that actually compared the use of a soy-based diet to a soy-free diet. And ultimately, what I wanted to do was I wanted to come up with differences, right? In other words, if you have a female that's exposed to this novel adult male, we know that she reaches sexual maturity. Why can't I capture that in my urine analysis? The other thing that I started to think about was that when we talk about the time of puberty, when we talk about sexual maturity in general, oftentimes people will describe it: it's a state of turmoil. My teenager is going through a tumultuous time. It's called sexual maturity, or maybe it's called puberty, and so all these changes start to occur. And I thought maybe instead of trying to measure. Absolute values of estradiol. What I really need to look at are the fluctuations that occur in estradiol, and that's exactly what I did. So here is data that was published some time ago in 2008, and what you'll see on the y-axis is not the absolute level of estradiol; it's the variation that exists in estradiol around the time of sexual maturity. So in my soy-based diet. It's very difficult to figure out, much like the way that I had shown you before, which female is exposed to a male versus which female is kept in isolation, for instance. When you change the diet, in other words, when you give these individuals a soy-free diet, which is nutritionally equivalent, what you end up seeing are higher bars. Higher amount of change that occurs in the case of the females that are exposed to males versus females that are kept in isolation. So this data was really valuable because what it started to show to other scientists who were studying the onset of sexual maturity in a mouse model was that you need to think about the changes that occur in hormone levels and not just the absolute amount. And you also need to think about. What kind of diet you're feeding these animals? Because your results could be washed out simply because of a simple thing like the diet that you are using. So I go back to my original manifesto, and I call this the scientist manifesto. And one of the principles that is included in this is to aspire for novelty even in the face of routine. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's really good, great, you solved a complex problem in the laboratory. How exactly does that apply to me? And to that, I respond: You have actually experienced this manifesto for yourself, probably a long, long time ago. I won't give it a number because some people are a little bit younger, some people are a little bit older in the audience. But when you were young, how many people participated in something called play? Just by a show of hands, how many people did that? Okay, so pretty much everyone said yes. I know what play is, and I did that once upon a time. How many of you had that one play activity that you probably did over and over and over again, maybe in your summer vacation, every day? Okay, majority of people. So what you were doing there is you had a routine, but you were aspiring for novelty within that routine. And one of the earlier speakers talked about the importance of play, and I think somewhere along the lines we forget to do that. And my definition of what playing is is exactly aspiring for novelty in the face of routine. And when I did that in the laboratory, I, as a scientist, was able to solve a complex problem that, on surface, seemed unsolvable. So, guys, just play more. 
Thank you. Thank you.